Hello and welcome to story time. Today our theme is all about houses and homes. Did you know that people live in all kinds of houses all over the world? Today we're going to talk a little bit about what houses look like around the world. And the first story is if you lived here, houses of the world, if you lived here in this dog trot log house, you would have to step outside to get to your bedroom or the kitchen. Your family's sleeping area would be in one section of the house, while the kitchen and living area would be in the other. Between the two sections would be an open hall with a floor where a dog could sleep or a possum could scurry through. If you lived here, so could you. If you lived here on this snowy mountain, you could shelter sheep, goats, and cows in your family's chalet. With many as four floors, your animals would live on the ground level while you and your brothers and sisters slept high above on the very top floor. Your skis, snowshoes, and ice skates would be placed under the lowest balcony by the entry door and your homemade cheese stored in the cellar. If you lived here, you'd need to scramble up a ladder to get to the hidden rooftop opening to enter your house. Instead of logs, your house would be built of adobe clay, and it would share walls with other homes to create a structure of up to five stories high that from a distance would look like a village. If unwelcome visitors appeared, you could pull the ladder up behind you. If you lived here, you could get up from your bed in the main house, have breakfast in the back house kitchen, and then walk to the barn without ever having to go outside. The connecting rooms make it possible for you to take your animals without having to trudge through the deep snow and howling winds of winter. Doors would prevent the cows, goats, and chicken, and geese from coming to visit you. <coughs> if you lived here, your bedroom would be inside a mountain. The front of your house, with its windows and doors, would hide the fact that your home is actually a cave dwelling. A chimney from the kitchen would poke up from the hillside above, and if another room was needed, your family could just carve one out of the interior soft rock. Then you would be among the 45 million cave dwellers living in the world today. If you lived here, you would catch fish from your bedroom window. Tall and strong wooden stilts would hold your house high above the rising tides of the inlet of the Pacific Ocean. At high tide, you could hop on a boat to visit a friend, and at low tide, you could walk the, around the base of the stilts to gather crabs or watch pelicans glide overhead in search for their own fish. If you lived here, you would step directly from your front door onto a boat to go to school. Your neighborhood would be on man-made islands, barely above sea level, with a network of canals filled with all types of boat traffic instead of cars, bicycles, and buses. The floors of the three upper stories of your home are made of wood and tile, but the floor of the bottom story is water. <clears throat> if you lived here, you'd have to cross three drawbridges to get into your house called a chateau. Once inside, you would have endless corridors with dozens of rooms to run through and seven towers to climb from which you could see for miles. In the surrounding pond, called a moat, you could row alongside paddling ducks and swans and over swimming frogs and turtles. If you lived here, you could always have friends at home to play with because your huge roundhouse would be home to dozens of families. Your family's own living and sleeping rooms would be on the upper levels, while cooking and laundry would be shared with others on the ground levels. The interior room faced inward into courtyards, and only the two top floors have exterior windows. <coughs> if you lived here, you could run downstairs to the ground floor to get your pretzels and fresh baked bread from your mom and dad's bakery. Your home would be separated from neighboring houses with walls that extend from the foundation to the very steep roof. From your bedroom under this roof, you could awaken to the sounds of cuckoos in nearby forests and the bustle of street activity below. If you lived here, how would you find your home when so many look alike? The color of the door and railing, flower pots on the stairs, or your father standing on the balcony would help you spot your house. 
These cube-shaped houses seem to sit on top of each other as they mount up a steep, steep hill. Because streets are often used like outdoor rooms, you might have to dart across a tiny lane to go from your bedroom to the kitchen. If you lived here, your brightly decorated home would be easy to find. With a brush or your fingertips in lots of colors, you and your mother and sisters would have painted the outside walls of your house in bold geometric patterns and shapes that look like flowers, leaves, and birds. Each house in your village is decorated by its family, and each has its own recognizable expression, just like a person's face. If you lived here, you could move with your family and bring your house called a yurt along with you. Easily taken down in an hour, a yurt is made up of parts light enough for a family's horse or yaks to carry it to new grazing lands where they are reassembled. Although the outside felt walls surround one large room, the yurt can be subdivided into smaller living spaces. If you lived here, you could travel with your family from Alaska all the way to Florida and always be at home. Tucked inside this trailer are fold away beds, a small kitchen, a tiny bathroom, a sofa, chairs, and cabinets filled with food. At your doorstep, you can have a campfire at Denali National Park in Alaska or spot an alligator in the Everglades of Florida. If you lived here, you could see the sunrise from your bedroom window, feel the house rotate, and later see the sunset from the same window. Using two steering wheels, you can turn your floating house to get a different view. When you want to get ashore, you just scoot over on a 20-foot long metal gangway. If you lived here in the cool of the trees, you and your friends could be high above the ground and away from your parents, brothers, and sisters. With a strong tree in your backyard and with whatever scrap materials you can find, boards, old windows and doors, used furniture, canvas, a homemade ladder, you can build your tree house to look whatever way you want. When you finish it and climb inside with your flashlight and sleeping bag, you'll be among the squirrels and woodpeckers and feel right at home. And on the very last page, it has a number for each of the houses that we saw and where you can find them around the world. And sometimes we have to move from one house or home to a different one. And sometimes those houses and homes don't look alike. And this story is about a boy who has to move to a new house. Leo lived with his dad in an old blue house next to a tall fir tree. The paint was peeling, the roof was mossy, there were leaks and creaks, and when the wind blew, the whole thing shook, but it was theirs. Leo loved the blue house in winter, with its hiding places and cozy spaces. When the old heater broke, they would bake a pie just to warm up the kitchen. They would dance. Leo loved the blue house in summer, with its garden full of raspberries and tomatoes. He would play in the yard until the sun went down. Lately, there was all kinds of construction going on in the neighborhood. Big new apartments were going up next door and across the road. Leo would watch the backhoes and trucks out of his window. They looked like tiny toys. I'm worried ours will be next, he heard his dad say on the phone one night. But Leo knew his dad was wrong. The blue house would be theirs forever. One day, Leo's dad picked him up from school, but instead of going home, they got ice cream and went down to the beach. I got a letter from the landlord today, Leo's dad said. They sold our house and it's going to be torn down. I'm sorry, bud. We're going to have to move. Leo was angry. How could someone just take their house away? He kicked and screamed and locked himself into his room. They couldn't tear it down if he never came out. But Leo got hungry and after a while went down for dinner. I'm angry too, his dad said. So after they ate, they danced and stomped and raged together. So they shredded on a guitar and Leo did a special scream solo. It made both of them feel a little less mad. 
Soon the blue house began to fill up with boxes. Every day another familiar object was packed away. When the blue house was empty, it was echoey and drafty, like a hollow shell. The walls look so naked, said Leo. Let's paint on them, said Dad. It made both of them a little less sad. The new house felt empty, too. It didn't feel like home. I hate it, said Leo. That's okay, said his dad. One day, Leo and his dad walked by the hole where the blue house had been. When they shut their eyes, they could see it clearly, hear every floorboards creak and the drip of the faucets leak. But when they opened them again, their home was gone. That night, as Leo lay in bed staring at the empty walls of his new room, he had an idea. What if we painted it, Leo said. Good thinking, said his dad. Then together they mixed the perfect shade of blue and made them both feel a little more at home. Little by little, familiar objects began to appear in the new house. After school one day, Leo and his dad baked a pie in the kitchen. And that night, they unpacked the stereo and danced and stomped and sang until it was time for bed. Leo had been right. The blue house would be theirs forever. And with each passing day, the new house was becoming theirs too. And the next story we have is an old classic story called The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse. And it's an Aesop fable. And this one has been retold and illustrated by Helen Ward. There was once a country mouse who lived a quiet life among the seasons. He knew the insect filled fields of summer and rich ripe orchards of autumn. He knew the aching hunger of a long cold winter and the smell of sun warmed earth into spring. The country mouse knew he was content. Then one spring morning, his cousin arrived for a visit, a fine, sleek city mouse with a lot to say. In the city, we don't have mud, he said, and we don't have dangerous wild animals. In the city, we dine on rich, exotic foods and sumptuous surroundings. We have such amazing sights and sounds, noise and bustle and hum. You should come see this, the, the wonders of my city. After his cousin returned to the city, the country mouse grew less certain of his contentedness. He felt a longing for new sights and sounds. At the first chill of winter, he hitched a ride toward the bustle and hum of the city. The country mouse gazed up at the high horizon where the cold sky met great towers of smooth stone and glass. The wonders of the electric city crowded his ears and eyes. He discovered lights in the dark in automatic ups and downs. He found his cousin's luxurious apartment, and after exploring the finery, he settled in to sleep. But suddenly the room was turned upside down. As he hid, the country mouse recalled his own grassy nest all snug and safe. But then some sweet smells and his own grumbling stomach drew him to a feast just as delicious as his cousin had said. A magnificent spread. But also dangerous. As they ran, the country mouse remembered with fondness his own simple but quiet meals. He also remembered the song of the thrush and the sound of the worm in the earth and the buzz of the crickets in the hay meadows. 
He longed to be back beneath the night sky, lit only by stars, to be safe, to be content. To be home. And once he was home, he slept deeply, just a country mouse drinking of spring. And there is the city mouse sleeping in a wedge of cheese. All right, so we've talked about homes and house. So what sound or what letter makes the sound that you hear in home and house? About it. Can you say it out loud? You're right, it's H. H says <sighs> And we just read a book about a mouse. So which word rhymes with mouse? Is it home or house? Say it out loud. You're right, it's house. House has the ouse sound at the end, and mouse has the ouse sound at the end. Good job! And our next story is called My House. I am Jim. This is my house. This is the roof of my house. These are windows. This is the door. This is the inside of my house. This is my living room. This is the kitchen. Upstairs is the bedroom. my bed. This is the bathroom. This is my litter box. I hear a noise downstairs. It is Jane. Jane makes my dinner. I like Jane. I like my house. I like my tree. I like my home. Meow. Okay, so we have a little finger play for you now. I will show it to you, and then you can do it the second time around with me. Now I need your two hands. I'm going to stretch your fingers to get them all warmed up. All right. Here is a house for a robin. Here is a hive for a bee. Here is a hole for a bunny. And here is a home for me. Okay, let's do it one more time. Here is a house for a robin. Here is a hive for a bee. Here is a hole for a bunny. And here is a home for me. Good job. All right, our next story is called The Little House by Virginia Lee Burton. Once upon a time, there was a little house way out in the country. She was a pretty little house, and she was built strong and well built. This man who built her so well said, This little house shall never be sold for gold or silver, and she will live to see our great-great-grandchildren's great-great-grandchildren living in her. The little house was very happy as she sat on the hill and watched the countryside around her. She watched the sunrise in the morning, and she watched the sunset in the evening. Day followed day, and each one a little different from the one before. But the little house stayed just the same. In the 
night she watched the moon grow from a thin new moon to a full moon, then back again to a thin old moon. And when there was no moon, she watched the stars. Way off in the distance, she could see the lights of the city. The little house was curious about the city and wondered what it would be like to live there. Time passed quickly for the little house as she watched the countryside slowly change with seasons. In the spring, when the days grew longer and the sun warmer, she waited for the first robin to return from the south. She watched the grass turn green, she watched the buds on the trees swell, and the apple trees burst into blossom. She watched the children playing in the brook. In the long summer days, she sat in the sun and watched the trees cover themselves with leaves, and the white daisies cover the hill. She watched the gardens grow, and she watched the apples turn red and ripen. She watched the children swimming in the pool. fall when the days grew shorter and the nights colder she watched the first frost turn the leaves to bright yellow and orange and red she watched the harvest gathered and pick the apples picked she watched the children going back to school in the winter when the nights were long and the days short and the countryside covered with snow she watched the children coasting and skating year followed a year the apple trees grew old and new ones were planted. The children grew up and went away to the city. And now at night, the lights of the city seem brighter and closer. One day, the little house was surprised to see Horselet's carriage coming down the winding country road. Pretty soon, there were more of them on the road and fewer carriages pulled by horses. Pretty soon, along came some surveyors and surveyed a line in front of the little house. Pretty soon, along came a steam shovel and dug a road through the hill covered with daisies. Then some trucks came and dumped big stones on the road. Then some trucks with little stones. Then some trucks with tar and sand. And finally a steam roller came and rolled it all smooth. And the road was done. Now the little house watched the trucks and automobiles going back and forth to the city. Gasoline stations, roadside stands, and small houses followed the new road. Everyone and everything moved much faster now than before. More roads were made and the countryside was divided into lots. More houses, bigger houses, apartment houses, and tenement houses, schools, stores, and garages spread over the land and crowded the little house. No one wanted to live in her and take care of her anymore. She couldn't be sold for silver or gold, so she just stayed there and watched. Now it was not so quiet and peaceful at night. Now the lights of the city were bright and very close, and the street lights shone all night. This must be living in a city, thought the little house, and she didn't know whether she liked it or not. She missed the fields of daisies and the apple trees dancing in the moonlight. Pretty soon, there were trolley cars going back and forth in front of the little house. They went back and forth all day and part of the night. Everyone seemed to be very busy and everyone seemed to be in a hurry. Pretty soon, there was an elevated train going back and forth above the little house. The air was filled with dust and smoke and the noise was so loud that it shook the little house. Now she couldn't tell when spring came or summer or fall or winter. It all seemed about the same. Pretty soon there was a subway going back and forth underneath the little house. She couldn't see it, but she could feel it and hear it. People were moving faster and faster. No one noticed the little house anymore. They hurried by without a glance. Pretty soon they tore down the apartment houses and tenement houses around the little house and started digging big cellars, one on each side. The steam shovels dug down three stories on one side and four stories on the other side. Pretty soon they started building up. They built up 25 stories on one side and 35 stories on the other. Now the little house only saw the sun at noon and didn't see the moon or stars at night at all because the lights of the city were too bright. She didn't like living in the city. 
At night she used to dream of the country and the field of daisies and the apple trees and the dancing in the moonlight. And the little house was very sad and lonely. Her paint was cracked and dirty, her windows were broken and her shutters hung crookedly. She looked shabby, although she was just as good a house as ever underneath. Then one fine morning in spring, along came the great-great-granddaughter of the man who built the little house so well. She saw the shabby little house, but she didn't hurry by. There was something about the little house that made her stop and look again. She said to her husband, The little house looks just like the little house my grandmother lived in when she was a little girl. Only that little house was way out in the country, on a hill covered with daisies and apple trees growing all around. They found out it was the very same house, so they went to the movers to see if the little house could be moved. The movers looked at the little house all over and said, Sure, this house is as good as ever. She's built so well we could move her anywhere. So they jacked up the little house and put her on wheels. Traffic was held up for hours as they slowly moved her out of the city. First the little house was frightened, but after she got used to it, she rather liked it. They rolled along the big road, and they rolled along the little roads, until they were way out in the country. When the little house saw the green grass and heard the birds singing, she didn't feel sad anymore. They just went along and along, but they couldn't seem to find just the right place. They tried the little house here, and they tried her there. Finally they saw a field in the middle of a field. The apple trees growing around. There, said the great great granddaughter, that's just the place. Yes, it is, said the little house to herself. A cellar was dug on top of the hill, and slowly they moved the house from the road to the hill. The windows and shutters were fixed, and once again they painted her a lovely shade of pink. As the little house settled down on her new foundation, she smiled happily. Once again she could watch the sun and moon and stars. Once again, she could watch spring and summer and fall and winter come and go. Once again, she was lived in and taken care of. Never again would she be curious about the city. Never again would she want to live there. The stars twinkled above her. A new moon was coming up. It was spring. All was quiet and peaceful in the country. Okay, so our last story for today is titled Home by Carson Elm is a house in the country or home is an apartment. Some homes are boats. Some homes are wigwams. Some are palaces or underground lairs. Or shoes. French people live in French homes. Atlanteans make their homes underwater. And some folks live on the road. Clean homes, messy homes, Tall homes, short homes. C homes, B homes, hollow tree homes. But whose home is this? Oh, what about this? world lives here? And why? This is the home of a Slo Slovakian duchess. This is the home of a Kenyan blacksmith. This is the home of a Japanese businessman. This is the home of a Norse god. Babushka lives here. 
Amunian lives here. A raccoon lives here. An artist lives here. This is my home, and this is me. Where is your home? Where are you? Thank you for joining me for story time. Make sure you check in on our websites for updated programs and library service information. Thanks a lot. See you next week.